Well, I think all of us are familiar with Matthew 28, 19, but let's read it uh, anyway. Listen as I read it to you. Therefore, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you till the end of this age." Now, I like the way Jesus put it in Mark's gospel, Mark 16, 15, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every person. And you know, as I've had an opportunity to experience a little bit of the world, I've come to realize that there is a massive dichotomy when it comes to the efforts we put out to reach people around the world that are normal in our thinking, normally developing people, versus the energy that we put out to reach people around the world who have various disabilities. This past summer, uh, I had the privilege of being in El Salvador. Uh, And if you don't know exactly where it is, I think we have a map for you to show you. It's in Latin America, of course. And um, in El Salvador, there is only one a therapy center for the entire nation of El Salvador. It's in the capital of San Salvador. And people, we, I met the ladies, the moms there, and some dads who rode the bus five hours, six hours, seven hours in order to bring their little child to this therapy center to receive 30 minutes of therapy and then got back on the bus and rode five, six, seven hours home again. My heart broke when I thought about what we could do, what we could do in El Salvador with just a little bit of money, how much help we could be in building these kind of centers around the country. And so we met with the new Secretary of Health and Human Services for El Salvador, and we asked him, you know, if we as a church wanted to come into El Salvador and wanted to adopt the disability-related ministry of El Salvador, would you let us do it? And he said, we need all the help we can get. And I said, yeah, but wait a minute, wait a minute, whoa. We're not giving any money to the government. That's not how this works. No, no. We're going to go right to the churches, and we're going to give money and work with the churches, and we're going to build centers that have a church connected to them, and we're going to teach pastors and local congregations how to care for the people with disabilities that they all have in their own congregation. That's how we're going to do it. Is that okay? And he said, absolutely fine. And so we're working to meet with the president of the country, uh, and it sh- hopefully it'll be next month, where we can go down and say this is what we want to do in conjunction with some mission groups here in the country. And we also want to partner up with IJM, the International Justice Mission, and come here and take this country and really teach people how to care for children and adults with disabilities because as much missionary work as has been done in El Salvador, and it has been massive, What's going on today there for people with disabilities is pecuniary. It is minuscule. In fact, I met one young man. I think we have a picture of him. I went to his home out in the bush, and uh, this was a young man who's confined. He's on the left, who's confined. Well, he's on the right, too. (laughs) He's uh, confined to a wheelchair, and uh, this, this is so tragic. Um, they told me he doesn't have running water in his house. His father has left. His mom is there raising him as a single mom, and they only have an outhouse. And uh, she has to carry him to the outhouse, and so she basically gives him no water to drink all day. Did you notice how dehydrated that poor child looked? She gives him no water because if she did, she'd have to carry him to the outhouse and she can't lift him very well. He's a grown man. And I heard this, and I'm like, oh my gosh, we could do something about this, and we must do something about this. This is the challenge that we face in reaching out and carrying out the Great Commission 
to the people around the world who have disabilities. And I know that you guys agree with this, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. I doubt if there's a single person here who wouldn't say amen. That's exactly the mission that we need to carry on along with reaching everybody else in the world. Am I right? Amen? Okay. Well, you can clap. It won't hurt you. All right. There you go. Now, let me read a little bit to you from the Bible. Matthew, uh, Luke, rather, chapter 14. Then one of those at the table with Jesus heard him, heard this, and said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. And another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. And still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. I'm not even going to touch that. And the servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done and there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited we'll get a taste of my banquet. Also in Luke 14, which Doug uh, Mazza is going to be talking about tomorrow morning. You don't want to miss that. I'm not going to get into the passage. I don't want to steal any of his thunder, but look what it says. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, and the crippled, and the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Matthew chapter 4, and Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. And watch, large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. I want to show you a map of just how big a territory the Bible just described to us. It's huge. It covers modern-day Syria, modern-day Lebanon, modern-day Jordan, and modern-day Israel. Can we get that map up? Uh, there you go. This is the breadth of where people had heard about the Lord and were bringing the sick and the lame and all these other people to him. Matthew 15, Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. And the people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking and the crippled made well and the lame walk and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Finally, in Matthew 21, when he was in Jerusalem, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. Folks, the Bible tells us that Jesus was constantly hanging around with people who had disabilities. Lame people, deaf people, blind people, dead people. There's a major disability for you, yeah. Okay. And, 
And, and, and what was he doing with these people? He was comforting these people. He was caring for these people. He was loving these people. He was healing these people. When I was in El Salvador, God, I prayed to God and I said, oh God, just for today, could you give me the gift of healing? I don't have the gift of healing like Paul had, like Peter had, but can you just give it to me one day? 24 hours because all of these wonderful women with their children in their arms were lining up to have me pray for their children. And I felt so helpless. I, you know, I, I said, oh God, please, just one day. Think what I could do in one day in this country. 24 hours if every single person I touched with a disability, I could heal. Jesus did this for three years. Can you imagine the impact he had on this entire region? And so I know that you are fully with me when I say this is our challenge, to extend the missionary outreach of our churches, both here in America and around the world, not just to people that we would consider normally developing, but to people with disabilities. And that's a challenge for us in the United States as much as it is a challenge for us overseas. But since I know you agree with me, on that. Now, I'm not going to take the rest of the time I've been given to talk to you about what you already agree about. Rather, what I'd like to do in the time I've got left is tell you a story. I'd like to tell you a story about uh, one little girl who radically altered my life and who has touched the lives of thousands of people. Her name is Jill. And next to the Lord Jesus Christ and my wife, Brenda, Jill is the love of my life. I want to show you a couple pictures of Jill, then I'll tell you about her. This first picture is when she was in the hospital as a little girl, when they were trying to figure out what was wrong with her. And, um, you know, uh, let me tell you while that picture's up a little bit about Jill. She was born in 1992. She was a, a surprise, real surprise. Um, and uh, when my wife, I'll never forget, came to the front door, I was out playing baseball in the front yard with our three boys and said, guess what? I'm pregnant. And I, I remember exactly where she was standing on the front porch. I was like, you're what? She said, I'm pregnant. I said, I know what you said, but how can that be? Well, it was. And we had Jill. And you know, for the first three months, Jill was absolutely normal. Uh, uh, just, just sweet, and everything was right. And then she started having seizures, and they began in her hands, and then they were spread to being grand malls, and then they just absolutely and utterly got out of control. Um, Jill would have six, seven, eight grand malls every single day. She wouldn't sleep through the night because she would be up having seizures, and so that meant for eight years, Brenda and I didn't sleep through the night either because we were up taking care of her having seizures. I remember on her very first Thanksgiving, um, she was born in January, so she was about 10 months old. She had 19 grand mal seizures before the turkey even came out of the oven. And we had to give our boys to some friends for the weekend, and we spent the entire weekend, Brenda and I did, sleeping in chairs in the, uh, in the pediatric intensive care unit. But that was normal for us. We, uh, the, we, we had the emergency squad at our house all the time. They knew us by first name. That's really bad when, when 911 knows you by first name. This is not good. And we, we were in the hospital, out of the hospital, exhausted. It, it was an unbelievable experience that we had with Jill. And here they have her in the hospital trying to figure out why she's having all these seizures. Nobody could tell us why she's having all these seizures. All they could say was, she's got a terrible seizure disorder. And I'm like, well, I know that. Would you the doctor? That's the best you can do. I could tell them, I could tell I knew that. Well, in the year 2000, when Jill was eight, she stopped uh, walking. Um, she stopped being able to sit up, uh, which she used to be able to do. We would have to strap her into a chair to be able to feed her because she would just roll right out of the chair. And we would have to carry her around the house. She couldn't move. She couldn't even crawl. And I remember we went to see um, our neurologist, 
And he said uh, to me, after Brenda had, he examined Jill, and Brenda and Jill had walked out, and he said, Lon, I want, just want you to stay for a second. And he said to me, he said, um, he said, you know, I I'm afraid the seizures have really caught up with Jill. And he said, I think we're going to lose her. He said, so if you have any final arrangements to make, he said, I didn't want to say this in front of Brenda, he said, because I thought it would upset her too much, but you should make those final arrangements. Now, when a doctor tells you that, it, it goes deep, folks. And I remember coming home that day in the year 2000, and I went up to my study, and I got on my knees before the Lord, and I begged God for the life of my daughter. I, some of you have been there. You know what I'm talking about. And I begged God to spare the life of my daughter. I begged God to intervene in some massive way and prove the doctors wrong. I begged God to show mercy to that child uh, and to me uh, who, loves that, who loved that child so much. And uh, it was an amazing time of prayer. I would like to announce that uh, last month, Jill celebrated her 23rd birthday. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And I want to show you a picture of what she looks like today. This is Jill today. Yeah. Um, she's not verbal, but she lets you know what she wants. And uh, let, me, let me go to one more picture. This is Brenda and me and Jill. And finally, one of my very favorite pictures of Jill, and that is here in the grocery store. She loves going to the grocery store, and she knows where everything she likes is on which aisle. And so all I have to do is just let her go. And she takes the cart, and she knows where the tater tots are, and she knows where the olives are, and she knows where the mustard is, and she knows where the ranch dressing is, and she goes through the store and shops. And I just try to keep her from smashing in other people's carts. And uh, this is when we went to the store. This was only a couple months ago. And she was so excited about me bringing her to the grocery store that she leaned over and grabbed me and gave me a big kiss like that. This is the love of my life friends. And I want to tell you, though, after that experience, when I prayed for God to spare her life, something massive happened inside of me. And all I can tell you is, because I don't know how it happened, but I went from seeing Jill as a burden to seeing Jill as a blessing. I don't know how God did that change. Because at the beginning, I, I must confess, honestly, I know it doesn't sound nice, but it's true, that much of me saw her as a burden that God had laid on Brenda and me. A burden that got in the way of us doing what we wanted to do and traveling where we wanted to travel and, and, and spending time the way we wanted to spend it. And suddenly, after that near-death experience on her part, everything changed and I began to see Jill as a blessing. You know, Jesus said in the Bible, he did not say that greatness comes from serving other people. Jesus said in the Bible, greatness is serving other people. Big difference. And you know, not too many of us, uh, let's read the scripture. It says, Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And I realized God had given me and Brenda an amazing privilege. You know, you serve your child when they're an infant, and then you serve them a little bit less when they're a toddler, and you serve them a little bit less when they were a preschooler, and then maybe you might have a week of intensive service when they get the flu, but you know that'll be over soon. But you know God has given Brenda and me the privilege of serving Jill our whole life. What a privilege that is, and I see it that way. And I, I would like to say to us that as we reach out to people who have disabilities and as we reach out to people who care for those who have disabilities, this is an important threshold 
for us to strive to help them get over. That is not seeing their condition or that of their loved one as a burden God laid on them, but as a blessing. Now, I only have a little bit of time left, so let me do this. There are three lessons that I've learned raising Jill that I'd like to conclude with, and here they are. Number one, I've learned that God puts people with disabilities into our world to tenderize our world. You know, even the most cutthroat, even the most aggressive people I know in business, in industry, in politics, there's a soft side of them that you hardly ever see in any other arena, a soft side that comes out when they get around people like Jill. And I thank God for people like Jill in our world. And we should too. Because friends, our world would be a much meaner place. It would be a much nastier place. It would be a much harder place if we didn't have, if God had not blessed this world with people with disabilities that cause our hearts to get soft, that cause us to drop that mean, hard shell and care about somebody else. The second thing I've learned in raising Jill is that, and even though I treasure her and I cherish her, friends, it's been hard. I need to tell you, it's been really hard. And the second thing I've learned is that suffering burns out shallowness. All suffering is not the same in our world, but all suffering accomplishes the same thing. It teaches us how to have compassion for others. It teaches us how to connect with others in pain. It teaches us how to have empathy for others. It teaches us how to comfort others. It teaches us how to encourage and pray for others. Folks, you meet people who are deep in the Lord in being able to comfort and being able to encourage and being able to pray and empathize, and you can be sure of one thing, they have known suffering. This is why Paul said, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, that God comforts us in all the sorrow we have so that we might learn how to comfort others with the same comfort that we have been comforted by God with. And I um, believe, honestly, that I'm a better man today, that I'm a better father today, that I'm a better pastor today, that I'm a better leader today, uh, that I'm just a better human being today because of the suffering of 23 years that God has allowed me to experience with Jill. I don't see it as a curse. I see it as a blessing because God forced me to go deep. As Brenda and I were singing the song, Oceans, let us walk upon the water. Give us a faith without boundaries. Let us be able to trust you, Lord, to the deepest degree. I turned to her and I said, you know, 40 years ago when we first got married and we were, you know, <laughs> 20, early 20s and just, yeah, we didn't know what was going on, uh, except we loved each other. Um, I said to her, did you ever believe that we could have made it through what God's taken us through over these last 23 years? If you'd have told me, I wouldn't have believed you. I didn't think I could go that deep. I didn't think I could walk that deep. But you know what, folks? God takes us places we're not sure we can go. And he burns that shallowness out of our life. But he doesn't do it with success. Success never made anybody deep or humble. It only makes them arrogant and shallow. It's suffering. And it's suffering is a blessing. G. Campbell Morgan, the great uh, British preacher, by the way, if you don't know about him, he's a wonderful, wonderful man. He taught at Moody Bible Institute for a number of years and was a very good friend of Dwight L. Moody and uh, then went back to London, his hometown, to pastor Westminster Church until he died. A wonderful, godly man. There's a true story about him being at a church as an interim preacher. And right after the service, one of the 
uh, women in the church came up to him and said, oh, she said, uh, Pastor Campbell, she said, we have got just the greatest new preacher coming. He's young and he's in, uh, in, uh, energetic and he's just, you know, he knows the word and, and we're so excited and he's just going to be so great. And she kept going on about him and G. Campbell Morgan didn't say a word. And when she finished, he turned to her and he said, ma'am, he said, he may be good now, but he'll be better after he suffers. That, that is biblical truth, my friend. Don't you believe anybody who ever tells you that all suffering is from the devil? It isn't. Much of it, all of it, is from Almighty God to take us places that success will never take us. God help us if all we ever experienced as God's children was success. Finally, the last thing I've learned is that God doesn't settle every account down here. You know how depressing that would be if he did, but it's not so. My daughter Jill has lived the life here on earth that the Lord has called her to live. And be careful, folks. Be careful that we don't judge other people's life by our standards. Be careful we don't look at someone like Jill and go, oh, that poor child. She won't go to prom, and she won't get married, and she won't be a mother. And what? Listen, Jill's the happiest person I know. I'm serious. She's the happiest person I've ever met. I mean, look, people cook for her, people dress her, people bathe her, people pick out her clothes for her, people ride her around, take her wherever she wants to go, people take her and get chimichangas at Chevy's and whatever she wants to do. And, uh, you, she never gets a bill in the mail, ever. <laughs> she never has to worry about her making the finance. She's the happiest thing in the world. She just wakes up, and you know the old saying, so much to do and so few people to do it for me, and that's kind of Jill's life. And she don't worry about a thing. Remember how Jesus said about don't worry, little children, but God knows what. She's a walking, living example of that. She's the happiest person. I guarantee you she's happier than you are. Guarantee you. So don't judge her reality by yours or mine. But it is true that Jill has a lot of limitations here. It is true that there are a lot of things Jill's never going to experience here. It is true that I'm never going to walk my daughter down the aisle. It is true that Brenda, when she goes out shopping, doesn't have her daughter to take along like most mothers do. These things are true. But you know what, folks? God is going to settle up with Jill. She's done down here what God wanted her to do. And when she gets to heaven, man, I just kind of cherish the idea in heaven that she's going to be way up there somewhere. And when I get there, She's going to look down and say, Lord Jesus, that's my daddy way down there. Can he, can he come up here and be with me, Lord? Because he served me when I was on earth. And he took care of me when I was on earth. And he protected me when I was on earth. And I feel bad for him being way down there, Lord. Can he come up here and be with me? And all these other people who have served and cared for you. Listen, friends. God settles up everything on the other side. And I'm looking forward to that day. And I rejoice in that being not a hope-so hope, but a no-so hope. Well, thank you. God bless you. Now, let me close uh, by telling you about... Um, Uh, an incident that happened with my wife and me. There have many incidents that have happened with my wife and me. But she's still with me. Praise the Lord. But we, uh, Jill was about three years old, and we were coming out of a school meeting, you know, one of these back-to-school to, back to nights. And, um, and I was sitting there. The meeting was boring as could be. I mean, I was bored out of my gourd. I, uh, and, and, but I looked around, and there's hardly any dads there. I might have been maybe one. There might have been one more was all moms. 
of these children with disabilities. And I remember looking at their faces, because I wasn't paying any attention to the speaker. I was looking at their faces, and I was thinking, I, could, I knew what they were feeling. They were feeling just what Brenda and I were feeling, exhaustion. They were feeling loss of hope. They were feeling discouragement. They were, they were feeling like they were isolated and by themselves. And I walked out as we were going back to the car that night, and I said to Brenda, I said, you know, somebody ought to do something to help those people. You know, and I started pontificating about how badly I could tell they were feeling and everything. And I think Brenda got, was pretty frustrated with me. And so she turned to me and she said, she said, well, Lon Solomon, she said, if you're so worried about these people, why didn't McLean Bible Church do something about them? <laughs> and you know what? I was up a lot of the night that night thinking about that and saying, you know, she's right. We need, <laughs> we need to do something about them. I never would have been open to that if it wasn't for a little person called Jill. If you'd have come to me, I'm ashamed to say it. And you would have said to me, hey, pastor, let's start a ministry for children with disabilities and for adults with disabilities. I would have just said, nah, don't think so. I'm ashamed that I would have, but I would have. But after God sent Jill into our heart, man, it's a different story. I got it. And so way back in 1994, we started a little ministry called Access Ministry with two or three children in a classroom and uh, four or five volunteers. And um, that's grown now. And let me say before I tell you this, that when the Apostle Paul and Barnabas came back from the first missionary journey, check it out, last verse of Acts 14, it says they gathered the church of Antioch together and they told the church not what they had done, but what God had done through them. And I want you to understand everything I'm about to say to you is in the spirit of what God has done through McLean Bible Church, not what we have done. But with that little ministry called Access, the Lord prospered that and it grew. And now we minister to hundreds and hundreds of families every single week. We have Sunday school class so parents can come to church because, you know, in a lot of churches, parents can't go to church. They have no, nothing to do with their children, uh, you know, and they, we have parents who were asked to leave churches because the children were, were making too much of a ruckus in the service. Uh, and, and we do breakaway on, on a Friday night where parents get three or four hours just to go out and they leave their child and break out on Saturday afternoon. We have um, a Soaring Over 7 summer camp which is a July four-week camp for children with disabilities. And then we also have a camp in August for young adults with disabilities because during the summer, these, these children have nowhere to go. Their parents have nothing to do. So we provide the camp for them and take hundreds of children and give them day camp. Uh, um, we, uh, we, we started a program called ADDP, which is Adults with Disabilities Day Program. Because, you know, when people get to be 22 years old, they age out of the public schools. What do you do with, the, what, what, what do you do with these young adults? And they have aging parents. So we set up a program where from 9 to 3, Monday to Friday, we kind of run school for them. And they come and they, they serve around the church and they do whatever they can do. Whatever they're capable of doing. Jill puts stamps on letters. She loves to do that. So we let her stamp all the letters in the church, whatever. And uh, other people sort silverware. Other people deliver packages. Anything to give the, these young adults a sense that they matter and that they're important and, and, and that they can contribute. And, um, and then, of course, Jill's house, finally, which is an overnight respite center. It was my wife's dream. And we can handle uh, 45 children a night who spend the night and they give their parents a break. And then we take them back to school the next morning. And their parents get 36 hours to sleep, to go out on a date, to, to play with their uh, other children, to do whatever. And um, all of this came from the life of a little girl who can't talk, who can't dress herself, who can't fix her own food, who can't give herself a bath, who can't comb her hair, and who can't put her earrings in. And God did that through that life. Folks, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
God has chosen what the world calls weak to confound the strong. Why? So that no one may boast before him. For as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. One life. And look what God did through one life. Brenda used to always pray, oh God, this pain is so bad that at least don't waste it, Lord. Don't waste this pain that Dwan and I are going through. Use this pain for the glory of Jesus. Folks, I want to encourage us to remember that God has an amazing ability to use people that we tend to write off in our world. Amen? And we need to be able to see through different eyes and say, God put this person here for a reason. This person has a divine purpose. This person is here to achieve something for the Lord. I don't know what it is, but we have a responsibility to help that happen. And I think we will be shocked at what God does through people that the world writes off as weak. Look at this little girl. I love the poem, and with this I'm done, called The Touch of the Master's Hand. Any of you guys know that poem? It's about an old violin that they were ready to sell for a dollar at an auction. And nobody thought much of it. And in walked this strange gentleman and picked it up and dusted it off and began to play it and played it so beautifully that people began offering $100 for it, $200 for it, $1,000 for it. And, and they couldn't figure out what the difference was. And the poem ends like this. It says, but the master comes and the crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. And uh, that's my testimony. That's my family's testimony. The Lord Jesus touched our life in a way I never expected. But the Lord Jesus touched our life through the life of a little girl with disabilities that has absolutely radically changed my life, changed our church, touched the lives of thousands of people. This is our message. The worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, if you'd have told me 25 years ago I'd be standing here talking like this about what we've talked about today. I would never have believed you. I would have been like Moses at the burning bush. I would have said, Lord, I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. Lord, pick somebody else, please. But Lord Jesus, you don't make mistakes. You knew just what I needed in my life to be able to be the man you wanted me to be. Not that I'm there yet, but I'm better than I used to be. And what Brenda needed in her life and what our church needed and what Washington needed. And you sent it in the person of Jill. Now, Lord, every person here is that same kind of gift to our world. And I pray that you would expand our understanding of the touch of the Master's hand and how you can take any life and use it to the glory of Jesus if we'll just give you that life. Lord, may that be the message we have to carry, the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the Master's hand. Lord, thanks so much for Johnny and friends, and I, I thank you so much for the uh, kind invitation to be here. And I thank you so much, Lord, for how you took a tragedy and how you turned that tragedy into, into a worldwide ministry. 
Lord, bless Johnny and Ken, everyone who works for and volunteers for Johnny and friends, I pray. And Lord, may everything about this ministry be able to be summed up in the phrase, it's all by the touch of the master's hand. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real honor and a privilege to be here.